Hi, uh, welcome to this, which is the fifth session of our special short course that produced by the Centre for uh, Creative Industries, Media and Screen Studies in collaboration with the Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art at SOAS in London. Um, and this uh, fifth session follows in the wake of sessions. We've had sessions on social media and the um, relationship between arts and social media. We've had a session on music and technology on digital filmmaking, looking at the African Screen World Conference, and uh, on the art market and the market for digital art and curation. And this time in this session, we're gonna be thinking about games. My name's Casper Melville. I'm a lecturer or senior lecturer in uh, global creative and cultural industries at SOAS, and I'll be chairing the session. I've got a fantastic panel of specialists to introduce you to. Uh, the first one is Marie Fulston. Marie is a she describes herself as a playful curator. She is a freelance curator and creative director uh, specializing in video games and play and digital design. Uh, hi, Marie. Do you show, show yourself? Hi. <laughs> Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, next, Kieran Reed. And Kieran is, uh, runs uh, two programs at Wits University in, in Johannesburg in South Africa uh, in, in digital arts and game design. Uh, he himself is a game expert. Um, I think he's going to talk a little bit about the relationship between online and offline gaming, because I think it's right. In, I'm right in saying, Kieran, that you're a specialist in on, in, in material games in real, yeah. outside the digital space. But obviously you're teaching a lot about digital gaming as well. And then my third guest is Tim Flusk. Hi, Tim. Tim is, um, well, he is, he currently teaches on that program at Wits University, but I think it's you were a student on that program previously, and you are yourself a game designer, a developer, um, and you're gonna be showing us some of your work, which I'm really excited about. So um, welcome all of you, it's really great to see you. Um, let me just start off by asking a rather basic question, but I wanna ask each of you, what got you into this? You know, What was the first game that kind of captured your imagination and made you want to do this? Kieran, what, what was the thing that did it for you? Um, I mean, you know, the first game I played was a game called Math Rabbit, um, which you know, my parents were like, okay, we're going to get you a game, but it's going to be educational. It was a black and white thing. You, you did the sums and you worked it all out. But really, I mean, as you mentioned, my kind of core passion is analog games, board games, card games. And getting into that was, you know, as cliched as it is, is Settlers of Catan which is you know, the gateway game and the entry point for so many people into that particular hobby. And I was studying theater and, and started playing that game and then thought, well, this is theater. And then sort of it, it, it all came about from that. It's like a sort of Dungeons and Dragons type thing, is it? Well, no, Settlers of Catan is very much just dice rolling, collecting resources, trading with each other. Um, I mean, it has huge problems in terms of its colonial themes, but we won't get into that now. We'll get into that but, later. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, we can get into that a bit later. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's what's called a Euro game. And, and from there, it sort of just spiraled out. Terrific. And how about you, Tim? What was, what was the thing that gripped you? Um, yeah, I think... Um... Much like my, uh, like Karen, my father was the main original influence on getting me into games. Uh, my, my, my communist father was very interested in getting me and my sister to learn how to play chess. Um, so even though I'm very bad at it, I've been playing it for quite some time. But I think more particularly, the game that um, actually provided some inspiration into the value and the, the consequences of games for me was a game called Dysphoria, which is a game by Anna Anthropy, which was a, a very interesting experience for me where it allowed me to, in some abstract way, to be uh, honest, um, the sensation of a, a woman, a trans woman experiencing, um, going through the, the, the transitioning process. Um, and I think that was particularly the game that has had quite a large influence on my thoughts and experience and development. Wow, and, that, and that's a digital game, is it? Yes. And what was the name of it? Uh, Dysphoria with a four. <laughs> Dysphoria, okay, yes. fascinating, fascinating stuff. Marie, so you're- Just been looking at the box up for Math Rabbit, by the way. Um, <laughs> oh. I'm pretty sad that I didn't get to play this at the time, but- <laughs> It was excellent. <laughs> What was your gateway um, drug for the, the game? Do you know what? It's kind of, I'm going to split this into two answers and not talk too long, but the first game that I think really captured my imagination, but was not the one that actually, I think, or maybe in a roundabout way, did actually get me into working with games, 
with um, Zelda A Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo, the SNES. And that was a game that um, that my dad was the person who brought the SNES into the household as a present for his daughters, but secretly a present for himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was always quite nervous playing, but it was something that um, I, I really treasured the memories of actually watching my dad play that game um, and sort of work his way through sort of the puzzles. But despite the fact that I was a spectator, one of the things that was um, really great about that game is that it came with a little physical map of the world, which you could sort of put down in front of you. And so my role when we were playing was to actually sort of be like navigator of the game. So sort of like dictating where on the map we should be going to and where should we be heading. I was also remembering like, oh, okay, there was a bomb crack over here or there was a part of a puzzle that's over there that I think we need to go back to. And I think for me, that's one of my most sort of treasured um, memories. And it's a game that I will go back to over and over again. It's such, it's just like comfort food for me going back and playing that game. But the one that really got me into working in um, games in a cultural sense was a game called, um, or one that I can look towards and say, and it was, it's, it's a range of games and a range of people and works, was actually the independent game Fez by um, Polytron. And it's a game that came out sort of in, I think, probably the early 2010s, maybe. Um, but um, it's a game that actually is also a huge love letter to that era of games from the SNES as well. And so it was the first time for me that... Um, like being sort of in my 20s working in films, sort of actually realizing, hang on a minute, as um, I guess a large part of this is as a woman, I've been told many, many, many times in many different ways um, that video games is not a space where I'm supposed to be. And it's not a space where there's this sort of playful interactivity. There's a lot of guns and we've all got 3D. And Fez just pulled everything back to what was um, so valuable and inspiring to me from those um, from those sort of childhood years and just showed me like, hey, do you remember that magic that you had when you were a kid? It's still here and there's people doing stuff in this really interesting way. And so um, for me, it just kind of showed me that there was this whole world of independent creators, um, sort of that whole sort of wave of the second independent um, sort of wave of the independent game scene in like the 2000s or the late sort of or the early 2010s. Um, so, yeah, so I'd say Link to the Past and Fez um, kind of as a, as a double you. act. I'm going to have to look out all of those. I don't know any of them, but I'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> to find out. Um, Marie, if we can, st- I want to start with you at, at quite a kind of macro level. I mean, uh, let, let me put, pose it in a, as a sort of in a stupid question, really, or a stupid statement, which is that when I was researching this panel and I, re- and I saw that you had, uh, you were the games curator at the VNA as part of one of the things that you've done. And I was completely unaware. I mean, why is there, why are there games in the VNA? in Victoria and Albert. You know, <laughs> you know, what are they doing what, there? What is what's that, the, museum you know, what's the larger relationship between the art, you know, the world of art, you know, things hanging on walls, museums, galleries and games? Well, oh, there's a lot of questions there. Um, mm-hmm. I guess I think the question is sort of why are games are in a space such as the v and And my practice as a curator didn't start at the v and obviously started or sort of preceded them. We can talk a little bit about that maybe in a bit, but um, why are games at the VNA? That the VNA is a museum that is primarily interested sort of in um, design, design process, and obviously covers areas like performance, photography, and the decorative arts. And so the VNA is interested in, in games, is that it's a museum that engages with contemporary culture. It's a museum that um, had and still has sort of uh, digital design curators. Um, position there and so video games are sort of a huge part of contemporary design and digital design and so it's um it's just part of the purview it's just sort of part of what they cover and it's it's interesting that sort of when a museum like the vna takes on games that you still cannot escape the headlines that sort of say sort of the vna declares that video games are now art and that's a that- whole load of things to unpack but it's like i'm sorry when did we say they were art we were talking about them as design like we can talk about games through many, many different lenses, but the lens we're interested in at the moment um, or in that exhibition in that museum was specifically design. And so that's why there was a curator of video games. At the it was only a temporary position, though, that um, there's a whole other sort of essay or probably PhD on why um, or why or how there will ever be sort of more permanent um, and persistent sort of positions of um, curators of video games or curators of games sort of um, more broadly. But um, but that, that's why that museum or that institution is interested. I mean, it's the same with others, that it's just like, it's just part of contemporary culture. There is a, there's a sense in which um, a game is not like other kinds of art objects because it's sort of not really happening if it's not being played. Yeah, games, games are and aren't like other objects, which, um, and I even find like, 
like especially through my time at the VNA that I was really pushed into an institution where um, obviously it's historically built around sort of traditional material objects and material culture. And that's sort of the history and period that the institution sort of developed through. And so all of the processes and practices that are sort of embedded in that institution all are really sort of um, lean towards sort of objects that have some sort of physical presence. Um, but video games, as you say, sort of aren't necessarily um, that simple that I think Video games are time-based. They exist over a period of time. Games are also interactive. And that means that, that unless somebody is there to play them, they do they do they do they even exist? Like if a game, if a game is uh, if, it, if we leave a video console in the woods um, and nobody's there to play it, like is, is does that video game even exist? Um, but equally there's a sense that when we think of games as performance, that we have to also accept that. Um, no two people will approach a video game in the same way. And no two people will approach a video game in the same way at different times. That everything that defines what that work is, is a product not just of sort of the digital sort of design and creativity of the, the game itself, but of the sort of physical environment, of the digital um, sort of software or hardware that we're interacting with that game with, but also the person and their sort of personal history and their experience, and their understanding and when they come to it. And so... Um, that's one of the things that I really love about working with games is understanding that it's actually really hard sometimes to approach it with this sort of, perhaps sort of, and it's 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 a bit of a um uh, it's a bit of an understatement or it's a bit of a sort of um a mis misnomer for me to say like oh this isn't true of other design or isn't true of sort of material design, but um but there is definitely a sense I think within more traditional um, areas of curation that. There's this drive towards sort of what is the definitive object? What is the thing that we can capture? What's the thing that we can preserve? It's got the and value attached to it that we can. What's, what's the value? Is it, is it this can? Is this this can is the original one? So this is what we're keeping and preserving. But with games, it's like video games. It's like, do you know what? There's a performance and they're ephemeral and they come and go. And actually, you can't capture them. And that might sound scary, but actually, I find it really freeing and um, a really exciting place to be because it means that actually we can try a whole range of approaches as to how we might capture or record or pres preserve or exhibit this um this well, medium I think, I think you've got some things to show us so i would love you to share that and and you know it what it sounds like is from what you've said and i think what you've said to me before is that this is a fairly new area it's a fairly open area and there's a series of challenges as you've just articulated it for how yeah. do you present and show this so i think that's what you're going to talk talk about. yeah so 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 just talking about like the different range of approaches and this is just a few that i guess sort of i've um done sort of in my time or my practice as a curator and this image actually shows sort of where my origins actually um lie as a curator and my route into being um as i call myself sort of like a curator of games or video games is one which didn't start where I even knew that title existed or that was the work that I was doing. Um, but I was somebody who, as I mentioned at the beginning through Fez, had become really interested in the independent and alternative game scene in sort of like around about sort of 2010, 2011. But for me at the time, I felt that there were so few cultural spaces and public spaces where I could go and just engage with this work and be around people um, who were um, equally as excited about this medium. Um, and... So myself and a few friends from London were really inspired by the work of collectives such as Baby Castles in New York or um, Handai Society in Toronto um, and, um, and uh, the Kokoromi Collective in Montreal as well, who were doing sort of these DIY sort of club night parties where they showcased video games. And, and like, especially with Baby Castles, you had this amazing sort of clash of like the really sort of like DIY art scene in New York with video games. And it just made these really really sweaty, grubby sort of photographs that I would see over social media of people like in a basement of a DIY arts venue, like with controllers and plastic cups of beer. And it was like, that, that is what I want. This is where I want to be. Whereas in the UK at the time, there was, um, there was, I think sort of like, we have games exposed, we have these big commercial spaces and we had sort of developer conferences, but I was like, where's this energy? Where's the, where are these cultural spaces um, that are showcasing this range of work? And so myself and a few friends um, formed a collective called Wild Rumpus. Um, and so we've, we, we still sort of go, we're still running, but um, we haven't obviously done sort of um, any sort of work or exhibitions for a, a couple of years now. Um, and hugely, obviously a huge part of that is obviously because of COVID. But, um, but the work generally, like we did a range of things, but the core thing that we did was to host um, sort of DIY arcade sort of club nights 
um, where we would showcase this work. And this photograph is of one of the events that we hosted in um, San Francisco. And this is uh, the UCLA um, Game Lab Arcade um, backpack. And it is sort of pretty much what it looks like, that it's um, a backpack that has been converted into um, an arcade cabinet. So, um, and these, these events were really about focusing on games that work within social settings. World Rumpus was really about showing games that are intended to be played in public with other people. Um, so it was really about, um, really about sort of that playable experience and interactive works. Um, but, um, but equally sort of, as you can see from this photograph, that even though the, the works and the things that we were exhibiting there were obviously sort of mostly sort of multiplayer games um, uh, and sort of physical games. But there was a huge element of spectacle as well and performance here that um, in this image, we've got one person obviously playing sort of the arcade machine, but we have a whole crowd of people stood around and watching. Um, and that for me sort of made me realize that whilst we sort of focused heavily in these events, um, on sort of playability and interactivity, that it was kind of the point for me where I began to realize that in terms of thinking about curating video games and putting them into public spaces, that there is a huge, huge element here of spectatorship um, and spectacle and performance. And that word performance is one that still runs heavily through sort of my practice and work. And so this was, this is my sort of origins. This is sort of really holding things together with gaffer tape, doing things with no budgets, doing things in nightclubs and sort of pubs and different spaces. And then I kind of ended up going from one end of um, sort of the curatorial spectrum all the way to the other. Um, and it was through that work with Wild Rumpus that over the years, um, sort of, we were invited to work with different museums, different institutions, and sort of people within sort of culture with a capital C sort of looked at the work that we were doing and sort of said, like, hang on a minute, this is an area that we want to work with and we want to um, get into. So could you um, come and work with us? And so one of those museums was the V&A, um, and I was hugely privileged to be um, sort of invited to be the curator of the video games exhibition, um, which was um, from 2018 to 2019, sort of ran for six months. And it was a big sort of headline exhibition for the museum. Um, and this for me was sort of a huge sort of going from sort of gaffer tape and holding things together with like just sort of keeping your fingers crossed really to this complete opposite end of um, sort of the spectrum of being in one of the sort of the world's leading sort of um, sort of design institutions um, and cultural institutions um, and being sort of tasked with sort of exhibiting works there. But um, unlike sort of wild rumpers, the tone of the space and the environment is very different. Like the V&A has sort of an expectation of what people expect when they come in the door, of what sort of exhibitions and tone um, and how they expect to engage in that space. And so it's not, an, it's not an exhibition space where we are necessarily going to sort of drop in a wild rumpus. Um, because also this was an exhibition that was seeking to look, um, to be a survey show of not all video games, but primarily contemporary video games. And the thesis of the exhibition was really looking at video games that are doing things that are quite radical or quite disruptive and quite different. And it was all, all the games in the exhibition were things which can sort of be tracked back to like a lot of technological catalysts from sort of the 2010s, like broadband, mobile phone, mobile phones, um, uh, social media, and just saying like, okay, all of these technological catalysts that have happened, how have they radically changed the way that video games are designed and played um, and talked about as well? And so the photograph that I've got here is at the first section of the exhibition, which was specifically looking at the design stories of, I, do you know, I used to know the numbers off the top of my head, but I think it was probably around about sort of eight or so video games. And unlike Wild Rumpus, the sort of ambition here was to really display and exhibit the design process of these games. And so... I normally sort of, I'm going to try and get through this super quick. I can't see what the time is. So also if I'm talking too long, please cut me off. I, but I will. I'm just going to talk through, talk through a couple of examples. But the first one is sort of um, just the video game journey, which um, was a game that was released sort of in, oh God, I can't remember the year now, 2010-ish. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, but it was made by that game company, sort of a small, mid-sized sort of independent games company. Um, and it was this sort of iconic, sort of um, critically acclaimed video game um, that came out at the time. But for us, the thing that we really wanted to do for these works in, um, in this space is, as I say, is talking and exposing them as designed objects and letting people sort of understand and sort of breaking down what I think can be a little bit of a bit understanding not just with video games, but digital design and digital culture more generally, that for a lot of people, it feels like a bit of a black box that we just don't really know sort of how things are made. Everything's sort of coded numbers, and that's a little bit too confusing for me, so I'm not going to really... I'm not really going to sort of understand this. 
And so what was really critical for us to do was to sort of make visible the design process and to humanize and put some humanity back into those works. And so you can see here sort of a selection of objects and materials that we had for how we exhibited Journey. And what you'll notice when you're looking at this is that nowhere on this display is the game Journey in a playable format exhibited. Um, we do have sort of on the far right sort of a small video which shows you an excerpt of what the game is with an intro panel telling you sort of the reasons why we think the game is important. But you can see the range of objects that we have here from sort of, um, we have concept art, we have um, some of the original sketches, we have um, sort of uh, videos as well, which show some of the research trips that the, um, the design team took. We have sort of footage as well of some of the early video game prototypes. Um, we even have a spreadsheet, which is one of my favorite things that I ever put into um, the VNA was a Google Docs spreadsheet. But, um, but across this, it's like you can look at these objects in detail and you can begin to understand the materiality of what actually goes into making games um, and understanding that actually sort of a lot of this is stuff that we can understand, that we can connect to. People can understand sketchbooks. We can understand sort of research. We can understand sort of, we can understand spreadsheets. We can relate to this. And so it's trying to open up and make visible this sort of, as I say, these temporal interactive objects in a very different way. Um, but alongside the sort of what we called sort of, um, oh, this music on this, Alongside the debris, um, as we sort of termed it, like these constellations of um, design artifacts, we also had uh, these large scale installations, which, um, which if I've got a way of muting this, I'm sure you guys can't, can't hear that, but it's distracting no, me, that. so I'm just going to pause it. <laughs> but, um, but we had these large scale installations in this space as well. And so this is um, sort of a, a concept that you can see from the designers, which we actually, one of the things that was really important to us about Journey was showing the um, sort of emotional journey that players go on through the video game and showing you sort of um, a snapshot of what happens across that time. And this image is actually, um, this installation was one that was actually inspired by, you can probably just about see it on this image, just above the spreadsheet, like there was this um, piece of concept on that the team made, which was actually like a graph which shows, um, which is also a cross section of the different landscapes and levels in the video game journey. And if you look at the landscape in that image just above the spreadsheet, you can see it actually forms a graph that is plotting um, sort of the hero's journey, like this emotional chart of the experience in the game. And so the installation that we created was referencing, um, referencing that particular um, piece of concept. And for us, it was a way of showing people, knowing that they weren't going to come in and spend the several hours that it might take to really understand sort of journey um, in, in a way that if they were able to, to, to play it by themselves in the sort of environment or context it was intended to be played in. Instead, the idea of this installation was to show them a snapshot of what that game was and to try and evoke or translate um, the experience. So it's kind of, for me, sort of a way of, um, as we said, like, because there is no definitive object um, with video games that actually we can, we can sort of interpret and change and create works and installations that are inspired by the games instead as a way to, to sort of translate and communicate to audiences about that, what that work is. And so that's an example of sort of the way that we approached thinking or exposing games as design. And there's just a couple more examples that I'll talk through a lot, lot quicker than Journey because I don't have as many pictures for that. But, um, but equally... In the exhibition, we also wanted to talk about games from the perspective of the cultural conversations that were being had around them. And so we had this space which was called Disruptors, which was specifically looking at the conversations that people, the incredibly nuanced conversations that people are having about video games. So you can see here sort of the opening section here was talking about video games are political, just understanding that as much as we can say, like, there's no politics in video games. Yes, there very much is, even in a game like Settlers of Catan, like there are incredible sort of like colonial subtext or not subtext, not even not even as much of a yeah. subtext, but, um, but, but equally sort of um, conversations about um, geopolitics, about language, um, about sort of race and sexuality um, within that section. And so, again, in this section, very few, there was a couple of playable games in this space, but the most part, it was works which were interpreting. And we were actually showing on the desk sort of quotes from, um, from social media, from articles, from um, different blog posts of people discussing that alongside this sort of talking heads interviews um, in the middle of the room with people sort of discussing um, different subjects that relate to each of the tables in that space. And um, yeah, and I don't know if I've got time to sort of explain or talk about this image, but this is more where my practice is at the moment, which is that I'm really, um, 
I guess sort of through through sort of COVID and being pushed to sort of um, as a curator who works with the digital, it was really strange to be pushed through COVID to um, realize that actually my practice has so often been about how you translate the digital into physical spaces, and suddenly being denied the ability to work in physical environments. And so the area that I'm really interested in, and this was um, is actually thinking about allowing people to explore sort of video games within digital spaces and using the virtual spaces of video games almost as the site for where the exhibition is or where the experiences are. And so what you're looking at here was um, a field trip that we actually held for the festival Now Play This um, in 2020, um, where we actually uh, worked with the games designer and artist Gareth Damien Martin, who led a photography, landscape photography workshop within the multiplayer game um, No Man's Sky. And so here we've just got a screenshot of the spacemen who look like they're exploring um, sort of some new terrain, but actually they're all just on a really nice sort of photography workshop. Um, and they're all going to go out and be tasked with um, coming back with some sort of portfolio. And so um, across, so I guess sort of the subtext that sort of runs through these images is really thinking sort of how much the context of the environment that you're working with can really radically change the way that you might approach the game, be that thinking about working in, within sort of like a DIY sort of um, working within a nightclub, working within a big sort of cultural institution or working within the video games themselves and just thinking about how there are so many different lenses and different contexts that we can look at games through. And there's so many different ways that we can interpret and present them. So, um, yeah, so I hope that gives a bit of an overview. It, it of, certainly does, Marie. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing that. I'm fascinated by the idea of, you know, running a class within the context <laughs> and space of a video game. Um, that's, um, and that is a, is a wonderful sort of on-ramp to our, to our discussion with Kieran. Kieran, you, you, I mean, you are a pedagogue, you're teaching gaming. Mm. Um, within the context of well a context which combines you know engineering and numbers and things which can be difficult for those artsy farty people like myself who gave up maths and and that kind of stuff a long time ago um but just before you because i think you're going to talk about the the course and and the students at, at vits but just tell me about what what's the connection between online and offline gaming or you, you use the word analog um you know i mean what what is what is a game you know what's the what what, does, what are, how do we define it and, dis and distinguish it from other things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we spend most of first year working with our students on how do we define a game. Yeah, of um, course. And, and it's <laughs> That's one of those, media, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> defining stuff. But, uh, you know, I think, I think those, the things that Marie's mentioning about what you're designing, designing interactions and designing experiences. And, and you know, it becomes hard to pinpoint where the game exists, but it's, it's, the making of it is actually about designing the experience and it's actually about designing the fun and designing the interactions and trying to understand that Tim's going to do this, Marie's going to do that, and then Casper's going to do this. And even Patrick, who's hiding in the background, is going to do something different. And how do we link their whole experience together? And, you know, so so defining it becomes hard. I mean, obviously with board games, uh, you, you can see there are physical objects as opposed to digital games. So they have some inherent art there, but unless they're activated, unless they become the play experience, they're just cardboard with nice printed pictures on them. And, and you know, but so defining the game is what we do and we spend a long time going through it. So there's some, you, you've defined it, this is, there's something collaborative kind of built in, even I presume games could be invented by one person, certainly an analog game, presumably could be invented by just one person, but you kind of need other people to bring it to life anyway, because you need to play it. Um, and it's something which has a relationship to art and design, but is that's not the thing itself any more than a piano isn't the music. It's that's just the kind of it needs to have some life put into it. Can you um, so you I think you've got some things to share with us. So please do um, share your screen and let and um, sure. let's sort of extend this into thinking about because my, my understanding is that the course at Vitz has been pretty successful. Um, um, you know, and, and a lot of your students have gone on to work in the sector. I mean, maybe you should just give us a sense of the size of the sector. So Maria's kind of talked a little bit about the relationship with curation and used the word independent and alternative quite a lot. But on the other side of independent and alternative is whatever we're going to call it, the mainstream. I mean, yeah. It's a big thing, right? I mean, it must be it's one of the, the, the most massive and financially successful parts of the, the creative industries. Is that right? 
Yeah, I mean, in terms of an entertainment industry, though, again, if we're discussing games as art versus entertainment, it becomes a tricky thing. But it is the biggest entertainment industry. It overtook music and film a couple of years ago. So it's certainly generating the most income around the world. And part of that's, you know, to do with mobile phones and the kind of accessibility and the changing of demographics and market there that has really shifted it to become the big entertainment thing in the world. Um, so, yeah, I, but, you know, it's interesting, the conversation around independent and how that's shifted everything, because in South Africa, our whole scene is kind of independent. There, is, there isn't kind of these big houses that are producing their, big, their own IP. Everyone's producing small IP. The, the, the kind of big companies are doing service work, you know, for companies abroad, often because it's cheaper to hire South Africans than it would be to be, hire an American. Um, but within our own context, there isn't a huge IP. And that independent, that indie culture is very much how our whole industry is built. And, and the kind of approach that everyone has, you know, um, like Wild Rumpus, we used to run a thing called Glitch Face, which was much the same. You would make controllers out of bananas. And that's where the South African scene sort of exists. Fascinating. Wonderful. Well, as a sort of fan of indie music scenes, you know, which are often the way in which new ideas are pumped into the system. And there's always a, you know, a... so please, please do share. I mean, I, I think you've got a video of some of your students talking about your. your yeah. Class. So, so, so I thought I'd just touch on what the course is and, and, and then I can show you how some of our students have responded to it. So we're, um, we're a full undergrad digital arts degree. And one of our major and starting points was in game design. Um, and we work with engineering students and with School of the Arts students. So we're really looking at the kind of intersection between the development process, like you say, the numbers, the crunchy stuff, the programming, and then that kind of critical theory around it, the, the looking at it as art, the kind of experiencing journey. Journey is one of the kind of core case studies we use for our second year students because it's such a powerful, emotive piece of art. Um, that, that, that kind of drives it through. So, so our program is a full four-year degree um, and, and we're producing animators, we're producing people who make assets for games, people who do the programming for games um, and, and a full kind of contingent there. Um, my personal kind of passion and interest is our first year course because they make board games. Um, and I, I, I have one with me. Unfortunately, our building is in lockdown, so I couldn't go get more. But this is one of our student games called Dr. Wizdingo. Um, which is playing on, in South Africa, there's a lot of these kinds of mooties that'll bring back your lost loved one or um, enlarge certain parts of your body and, um, you know, all of these kinds of things. And, sort of and the spiritual kind of thing. Yeah, but, but, but sort of flyers that are handed out in the trash. So, so, so this is one of the games. And it's so nice that our students used to be, I mean, with COVID, it's different, make the kind of physical object um, and, and, and go through that kind of experience. Um, and one of the reasons we start them on analog and start them on board games is so that much like uh, Maria was talking about exposing the design, that's what we want to do. You know, with, with a computer and a digital game, it's harder to see that. With this, it's very easy to see this is the component this is the card, this is the dice, this has to be rolled, and then this sort of thing kind of materializes from that. So, so we try to expose design at the beginning and then let the students move into kind of making beautiful, technical, and all of those kinds of things. So this is a video actually that Tim made with his co-lecturer from last year um, looking at our third-year course. Um, which is very much the moment where the students are given free reign. Um, it's quite a long video, and I'll, I'll, I'll share the links with Patrick to our YouTube, and, and people can take a look at what our students are doing in detail. But I just wanted to share some of the stuff that to hear how they talk about their games and how they talk about the kind of interaction that they're having with their games. We are excited to present to you the results of the hard work from our students today across many different types of games and intentions. We hope you enjoy. I'm Zayana Albertain. I am currently a third year student studying a BA Digital Art degree. I major in animation and game design. I am currently the artist for the Sezi Town project. Hi, I'm Samantha. I'm a digital arts engineer in my final year and I'm the designer for Sezi Town. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm also a digital arts engineer. I'm in my final year and I'm the programmer for Sezi Town. 
Sezi Town is a super comforting, warm, loving game for everyone to play. Um, it is specifically catered to the queer community, creating a safe, loving space for everyone that plays it. We wanted it to be a really relaxing game, a really calming game, just like Stardew Valley, where you log on and you're just completely taken out of all the stresses of life and you can just grow your little crops and talk to your wife. Well, the intention of the game was to initially avoid stereotypes at all costs and so we took inspiration from a lot of our friends that are part of this community and we also took a lot of inspiration from ourselves and what we would like to see in this world. Okay, so great. Um, I think before we continue on to other, um, the other videos, there's a whole length and it explains all the games. I thought that just highlighting um, Sazi Town as a kind of primary example of the work that our students are doing and and much like that kind of independent spirit there's an interrogation and you know it's partly because they're in a university environment they're in a space where gender identity and politics is being explored this this becomes the kind of theme that our students are dealing with and it's really nice to see because much like you're talking about that kind of commercial first person shooter go out and kill people and that makes all the big money we're seeing our students really experiment with what the medium is and what it can do and who it can be for and the kind of changes that it can make for people um, which is why i wanted to highlight that particular um, video and st students yeah it was fascinating to hear them talk about the kind of mood that they wanted to, you know, project. They wanted to be relaxing. They were, you know, they were talking about the kind of thinking about the emotional component of engineering and design, which is, I suppose, it, in that way, it's perhaps a little bit akin to architecture or recognizing that, you know, you're creating an, amb an ambience with, by creating a space. Yeah, and I, I mean, I mean very much, and I, I don't want to speak for Marie, but you know, the design kind of exhibitions that we do see are very much about how do you design that emotional experience? How do you design that through line, that taking someone from this point to that point and they've changed or they've experienced something? And, you know, because our students are, while they're making the whole time, they're learning to code, they're learning to do the assets, they're interrogating games, they're researching games, they're researching the impact of games. So we have a nice kind of combination of, of that criticality with that skills-based development, design, thinking through stuff in, in that method. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, I don't know if you had anything more to show. Do you want to stop sharing your screen now? And No, I think, uh, yeah. That's fine. We'll, we, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to Tim in a sec because, you know, it'll follow very nicely. But let me ask you a kind of nerdy academics question. How, when you're marking this work, how do you mark the sort of this really important element of the kind of experience of actually playing it, the journey and all of those things? I mean, what, what are some of the criteria you use? Presumably you play them. Yeah, I mean, so we try to we try to get our students to reflect a lot and to kind of submit with their work. These were our goals. These were our intentions. This was what we were trying to evoke, trying to work towards. So we we mark the reflective process more than necessarily always the success of the game. Yeah, because that becomes a little bit easier to to go, well, you're thinking it through. You've made a decision here. You've made a choice that's actually quite a good one or maybe that choice doesn't meet your intentions and what you set out to do. The other side of marking is, is the more difficult and tedious one, and Tim can speak to it, is the coding. You know, is your code rubbish? Is your code a little bit... Oh, wow. Well, yeah. let's, let's bring Tim in on that, actually, then. So how do you mark code? I mean, it's just a bunch of numbers and squiggles, <laughs> isn't it? Or it's a language, right? Um, yeah, it, it has basically been under debate ever since um, 2013, when the second year course began uh, on how to approach this and how to handle it. Um, often the, 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 the questions of, it becomes a question of the identity and the purpose of the course and the degree, where we aren't computer science, we aren't engineering. And so we need to interrogate where we fit within those um, uh, spectrum of, the, of, of academia. Um, where it's, it's functionally closer to like, well, we, we don't intend in, in, to use a very um, 
uh, misleading analogy, but maybe a useful analogy. Uh, we don't interrogate um, the quality of the cardboard used. We interrogate whether or not the cardboard is able to handle what is available for your, your board game uh, under first year. And so for, for quite some time, there has been a sort of demonstration of just um, assessing it from the perspective of whether or not the game design is able to be expressed in the, the final artifact. Um, uh, we have been recently been trying to find ways to sort of navigate us slightly deeper um, as we sort of move towards um, not just looking at game design from the perspective of the ludic um, gaming aspects, but um, try to encourage students to start interrogating design uh, from all aspects. Um, so primarily this is <laughs> A very common theme. It uh, one of the things we try to do in third year is start discussing what is your community de design actually around your game. Who is your who is the person playing your game? Why are they playing your game? When do they play the game? How do they play the game? Who are they playing the game with? Um, Where that's the community design aspect. And then, well, since we are looking interrogating these things from this perspective, of this rhetoric. Um, the technical design is also fundamental. And this, the, this has led into some interesting things where, um, as Kieran has mentioned, that many people make the game where technical design actually becomes um, a professional practice design. It becomes an aspect of how do you communicate the game to the computer, and, but how does that allow you to communicate the game to the people working on the game with you um, and things like that. So. Wow. So you, I mean, just to, to reiterate, you, you, you were a student on this program yes. and then you subsequently became a game designer and went out into the game design world. Did you work in the corporate sector, would you say? I mean, I don't know how to use the exact language here. Or was it, in, was it one of these indies that um, Kieran has kind of described or how corporate did it get there? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess um, it got to the most corporate it could have gotten, uh, which is not much. Um, as uh, one of the, the major big companies that uh, participate in game development um, in the country are these service houses, um, particularly in my case, a programming house where uh, clients outsource their, their production of the game to other countries um, because it's cheaper. Um, that is primarily where I spend uh, most of my time whilst I was in the industry. Um, and does this mean you're basically producing something, a product or a game that someone else has designed and you're just, you're doing something to their plan, their pattern? Yeah, precisely. That is uh, my most, yeah, that's my, basically my most, most of the time of, of my professional experience, which is probably the reason why I ended up coming back into academia um, for that purpose yeah. of trying to start actually uh, interrogating, having the space in the field to start actually interrogating the purposes of games, which is the reason I got into this in the first place. Well, great. And I think you've got some things to show us, some examples of your own work. I mean, one of the things I, just before you show that, I mean, I'm interested in when you're teaching students about get design, you use the word design often in a way which uh, is to do with the experience, is to do with the tech, you know, the te technology up to a point. Do you also, you know, teach them the history of art or so, or, or what's the connection to kind of visual information? And, you know, is, is there a relationship there between you know, the worlds of art and outside and, and video games themselves? Yeah, it's, it's, it's always um, a very interesting question um, that it comes to you about. I always mention to people, uh, specifically my students, is that video, video games in particular um, fall into this weird, weird realm where we're simultaneously the youngest medium uh, to, to currently exist in culture, but um, are affecting to one of the oldest forms of expression um, that we have with we we retards to talking about play in a sense. And I think it's it's quite a fascinating thing that um, at least all the mammals, I'm not a biologist, a herpetologist or an entomologist, but um, ha have this process of being able to play, even particularly across species where you, your dog will actually play with you in the sense, mm -hmm. which is something we don't really have with the other media that we actually generate as a culture. Um, so play is quite innate in our existence um, as these intelligent beings. Um, but so they, they bring all that um, uh, sort of cultural baggage and expression baggage um, across millennia, obviously, um, 
and then get sort of turned into this very, very new medium uh, format and platform. Um, uh, so consequentially, when you are discussing and talking about and creating games, you, you have no choice but to start looking at the way every single way, art, art, cultural art artifact that existed before you. I think one of the important things here, I think Kieran somewhat mentioned it, and I think Marie has also somewhat mentioned it, is theater is one of the fundamental things to understand when making games. Um, obviously writing and visual art and phone and all these things do um, uh, slot into games eventually. Yeah, so I think this is sort of a useful demonstration about what it um, has sort of become over time. I, one of my main uh, core uh, driving parts of my research and also my development process is just to start interrogating why um, mechanical sets and genres even exist at all, why, why, the, thing, why the things that are, games are produced in such ways are, are allowed to exist and where they come from. And so this is sort of some of the very, very early work, so I apologize, it might not be that appealing to see, um, uh, where I started interrogating um, how things such as stealth, which is usually uh, a very powerful tool for producing um, a, a power fantasy, um, no one being able to see you and being smarter than the enemy, um, actually speaks closer to the sensation of being um, an at-risk, um, marginalized individual. Um, so in this case, I have sort of constructed the sensation of looking at like, what does it look like let me just make sure if this, <laughs> I apologize, I quickly need to turn the sound off as well. Um, oh, at least down. Um, where stealth mechanics actually speak to the sensation of trying to go through the world um, whilst avoiding, I hope it's not bugged, as I said, it's quite an old game. <laughs> um, going through the world and avoiding sort of the oppression of the society and the hegemony as a whole. So what does it start looking like um, when you start um, uh, hiding yourself and pre preventing yourself from being seen by the world because the world is actively hostile towards you? And that, that considering what the stealth mechanical set had become in games, it made more sense that it should be applied to something like this. Um, so generally what, what how this game works is that you sort of are trying to avoid these sort of characters on the screen by, um, ironically, uh, we uh, utilize some of the more notorious um, uh, adverts of some fashion media, um, uh, I I'm not very good at my own game. Um, uh, when you have to hide behind what people expect you to be. And consequently, if you are caught sort of within this realm, you, have, you end up in a situation where you need to start, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Appealing towards people's sensibilities uh, from everything they say. So the, um, all the dialogue amongst all these things that they say to you is sort of the microaggressions where sort of these people uh, are advocating that they're not racist or this, that, the other, or some more significantly uh, more aggressive statements. I noticed one of the microaggressions in the cloud was you speak such good English or yes. words to that effect, right? <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. So um, do, can you say a little something that it sounds, it feels from what Kieran has said and what you've said that you're, coming at this from this slightly independent, critical, de almost decolonial angle. Um, what's the issue there? What are you trying to address? I mean, what just to state it for those people who, I mean, uh, all right, there's a cliched view of the gaming world, but yeah, it's shoot 'em ups Grand Theft Auto. It sort of glamorizes, you know, mass murder, uh, you know, sexual violence and all the rest of it. I mean, is that, tell, tell, me, tell me something about that and what you're trying to do about it. Excuse me. So yeah. So um, this 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 conversation, this um, answer is very likely to sort of trail off quite quickly because it moves into quite a bigger discussion. Uh, so please just stop me when I when it starts to get out of control. We've got but, time for that in the, in the <laughs> Q and A as well. So exactly. top line. 
Uh, yeah, so basically for me, it was the sensation that uh, I was starting to appreciate um, games as this cultural consequence. Um, and so if it, if it is this thing, this cultural artifact, we do need to, we start to appreciate that the whole art um, mirrors reality and the reverse as well, where we, what are the consequences if so many video games, what, or rather, why do video games demonstrate these things of war and colonization and all these things, the notorious 4X um, uh, genre, the explore, exterminate, etc. Um, and I was curious as to, well, that has to come from some sort of cultural zeitgeist. Um, and and it was very clear where that cultural zeitgeist was coming from, was sort of like a global capitalism and your military industrial complex, et cetera. And so I decided to start interrogating, well, what, what, what is my cultural understanding of the world? What do I believe about it and stuff like that? And it's, it's generally the sensation, people always discuss it in the terms of they would like to see people like themselves in games uh, or, or, or create games that exist that exist in a world or present a world that is um, a slightly more what they would like to see. But I, I, I'm slightly from a different angle. It's sort of moving towards representing the reality as I see it. So utilizing the stealth mechanic to represent what it feels like to be a marginalized person within an hegemonic world and sort of some of the more research heavy uh, works that I've been looking at and trying to figure out and unpack was things um, that um, I have looked into, which is starting to look at um, the consequences of games as systems and the consequences of the world we exist in as systems, where something like city builders or nation builders or et cetera, whatever they may be, speak to a certain kind of way and philosophy of how cities are built. And I started to become curious about the way cities are built in post-conflict societies. Um, there's some research about that there are certain uh, cities in particular that are very obviously touched by the consequences of oppression. Um, and so some of the things I've been looking at and trying to unpack and understand um, is what, uh, how does one construct a game where we have the player act as an apart um, an architect of apartheid, and how do you how do you start building cities as an architect of apartheid? Why do you do it? How do you construct them? Um, which I think is very much more effective at revealing things of like how systemic racism and systemic oppression and the consequences of colonialism actually carry forth um, into our current reality, basically. So there's a way of kind of getting people to think about the experience of having put together a system of oppression and yes. the decisions that you make and what it, you know, the, but the kind of mechanics of it, because obviously it was built and constructed in a certain way, but the game can replicate that or can force you to encounter it. Yes, precisely. Is that intention with the idea that, you know, games are entertainment and, you know, if it, it, the ones that are going to make money and, and speak, succeed are the ones that teenage boys want to play. And those are, you know, call of duty. And is it, is it, is there a tension there or is it, do you think it's perfectly possible that games which aren't, don't have colonialism embedded with them or, or violence can also be, you know, globally successful? Um, yes. So this is where the conversation begins to unravel, basically. <laughs> uh, one of the, the terms that I think is quite useful for discussing this is, so there's the notoriously well-known the military industrial complex, um, but I've, I've heard people sort of extend it into explaining what it means when you start in, in, in um, ingratiating that with propaganda, sort of known as the military industrial media entertainment uh, network, um, where film, books, um, and video games all are contributing to um, the continuation of that. And effectively, um, games and all media, etc., that are designed to start um, interrogating that. And particularly the ones that are the more successful at it, obviously, are sort of set up to not be as successful for that purposes, right? Um, and so uh, when it comes to the discussion of whether something is successful, especially for games, I I'm sort of in a space where I'm less interested in um, selling the work um, and far more interested in, well, for one, uh, producing uh, 
developers who are able to contribute to that work for one uh, through the through working adverts, but also uh, far more interested in uh, um, bold in the work at all to see to interrogate whether or not it's possible. Um, again, fundamentally, I don't think video games are going to solve colonialism or the, the horrors of capitalism. Um, and there's significantly different kind of work that needs to be done to continue uh, to contribute to that. Uh, but there are at least ways in which games as systems, um, uh, as one theory, one, one perspective, does reveal closer to people to help them understand what those systems are doing and how those systems actually work. That's uh, it, that's so interesting, and this you know the idea that I mean it, this connects back to the discussion we were having about music and tech uh, last week with um, Kaya Malami, who was looking at how Western assumptions and in fact West, Western musical hierarchical thinking was embedded in music production tools, and and he has built his own uh, you know sort of web tools to try you know which do not reproduce the kind of prejudice or you know the uh, which is embedded in the the typical digital audio kind of environment i mean is it the case that i mean the the, the, the digital tools we're using are not neutral they do have a certain inbuilt you know issues capacities flaws is that the case in gaming as much as any any other realm of digital space oh well i certainly hope so because it's the basis of my masters but yeah for what i can <laughs> tell um for the most part it's uh, again it also comes down to the consequences of games being a um, uh, um, an output from all the media that, can, that has come before it. And also what it means, it's an output of all technology that has come before it as well. Um, so I think the, the main example that was that's really um, um, iconic is the um, fo of our photographic cameras struggled to render black people in the 70s and the 60s and they eventually fixed it. Um, uh, by, by Baldwin Moses uh, circuitry, where we do have similar analogs to the same uh, technological consequences in games where for one, um, uh, artists have uh, certain bias techniques that have been, uh, uh, that don't work as well on, 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 on rendering a darker, darker toned people. Um, and that, that, that's a practice and that is certainly more easy to solve, but it does mean that all the technology that's based on providing artists with tools is tested on that same information. And so once that data, obviously the data is not being uh, generated as correctly as we would want it to be for rendering a wider variety of people. That's so interesting. Kieran, can I ask you about, um, this is about sort of geography a little bit. Is, is, there, is there a different aesthetic? Is there an African game aesthetic, which is different or that you can tell? Or is that not the right way to think about it? It's just geography is not that is important and people are working much more in a kind of transnational global space with a, a global set of criteria. Yeah, um, it's something that we're always discussing with our students. Um, and as the program progresses, we are seeing more of a kind of African aesthetic, you know, um, African stories more than an aesthetic, maybe. Um, narratives coming through within the, the games that are being produced um, and all of those kinds of things. But we are heavily influenced by the independent scene that exists in America and, and Europe and those kinds of things. And our big successful games from this country might as well have been produced for the most part in, in another part of the world. Um, and part of that's a kind of sense of needing to sell needing to kind of be commercially viable as a South African product. Um, I think there are ways of weaving in the, the, you know, Tim's talking about his lived experience and how do you weave that into your story rather than trying to create something that's African, because then that runs the risk of being African curio and selling for, oh, look, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's in the belly design everywhere. And that's Africa. Well, Africa is a lot more than that. You know, it's, it's a huge continent and, and there's so many different perspectives and even South Africa is massive. So, so it's about finding stories that are universal but very applicable. And I think that's where we'll find our aesthetic rather than in a necessarily a distinctly visual perspective. In one simple visual or, or indeed. Yeah. I mean, but does, does African music come into the, the making of, of African games? Um, 
I, no, I don't think so. Um, that, I mean, point. yeah, it's, it's not something I've really considered. I, we have a few students here and there who deal with music in games, but it's actually not, we don't have the capacity yet to have it as a big element. Mm. Um, but, the, but it's a really interesting question and, and something that's worth looking into. But none of the games that I know have distinctly African music either that, that's attached to it. Thank you. And it's lovely to see your cat. Don't don't push it. Don't push it away. Um, just to let everyone know, we're going to we're going to be switching platforms in just a second. So we're going into. Uh, you will all have a link that we will follow. We'll have a five minute break in between to let people gather, um, and you know comfort breaks and whatnot. And that's your opportunity to ask uh, questions of the panel. So please do feel very free to post questions in the chat. If you're willing to turn on camera uh, and talk, please do. And we'll try and have a you know an interactive conversation about some of these these themes. Just to kind of tie this all off, Marie, I was just wondering if you could give us a sense of the scale of what we're talking about, because we've kind of established that there is, you know, there is a big mainstream gaming, uh, you know, economy out there, probably I'm imagining dominated by America, uh, and perhaps also Korea, I don't know, give us, and then there's these, this independent thing. I mean, how big, it, how, how does it look from your perspective? <laughs> is it, is it very scale. Western? Based. Oh yeah, it's it, it, video games is as a yeah, it's it very as you say very dominant by sort of um, North America, um, sort of a lot of sort of Western Europe and equally sort of Japan and um, and Korea and sort of East Asia. But um, there's and that's sort of obviously sort of um, a huge part of sort of the conversation. But in terms of scale, like I think it's one of the things that um, when we talk about video games that frustrates me a lot is that the focus is so much on the way that we can sort of quantify the medium and sort of validate it through numbers and figures. And um, and it's it was almost inescapable at the VNA. It was like we kind of almost had to set that up at the beginning where every time sort of the games industry sort of has a game that outsells like um, or raises more revenue than um, sort of a blockbuster film, that's immediately the press release that goes out and the headlines are immediately like, maybe now video games will be considered art because this game has sold more than um, that sort of Marvel film over there or it did more than, it's more than music and film combined. So maybe games are art now. And it's like, yes, there's a huge scale here, but I think sometimes those are things which can sort of um, hide or sort of um, prevent us from actually really ex understanding and appreciating the nuances of the medium and understanding the value. And I think the areas that I'm really personally interested in at the moment are... Um, and I guess one good example, and I don't have the figures or numbers in this, but in terms of scale, like this, one of the spaces I've foolishly come to so, so late, but I'm so, so captivated by is what is happening in spaces such as Roblox. Uh, and Roblox being sort of um, hugely popular with sort of um, much sort of younger generations and children and teenagers, um, but being essentially sort of like a platform, both sort of the games and the tool within and, and sort of the the sort of ecosystem as well within which people can create and share sort of both game, games um, and also sort of just virtual experiences as well. And it's um, it's work that I've, it's a space that I've really loved sort of experiencing with friends, um, specifically during COVID, because it's all sort of built on sort of um, multiplayer sort of, um, sort of gaming experience or virtual digital experiences. But what is really great about that is it still like, if you don't know about Roblox, you're going to because there's so much money and so much headlines coming out of this at the moment. So many brands going into that space that you're going to hear about it. But the big headline stories that come out of that, like the, the one Roblox game that makes sort of millions um, or allows sort of like teen creators to, to pay off their parents' mortgage, which whilst that's great, what I really <laughs> desperately love is that you have this sort of almost outsider art or folk sort of space where at the moment there's some real amazing stuff happening in the nooks and crannies of just games and works that people are just making for their friends or for small communities. And, and I don't know sort of how many works or games are on there, but I think sites like that, when we're talking about scale, that's a scale that I'm really excited by. It's not necessarily um, one game sort of reaching X number of people making X amount of money, but X amount of games all collectively managing to speak to maybe smaller pockets and people just creating and sharing. But instead of that craft perhaps being sort of um, traditional or established mediums, except that craft is kind of games. And it's like thinking about games less about sort of through this industrial lens, but instead thinking about it through sort of community and craft and communication um, and sort of collaboration and, um, and sharing. And so that's a space where when we're talking about scale, I'm interested in personally, rather than sort of thinking about um, sort of 
the numbers or thinking about it through this sort well, of listen, industrial lens. We've got the indie sector here, and I'm very happy that we have got you here. Um, why is play important, Kieran? What, um, you know, why is it important? How has it been treated in the past? Why is it necessary? Isn't it just kid stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so play is our kind of um, principle and, 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 and guiding light for the department and, and the way that we view things. Um, and, you know, as Tim mentioned, it's a fundamental aspect of just on a biological level. It, it, it's how people learn. It's how people experience things. It's how people communicate to some degree. Um, Tim was talking about that, that playing with your dog. And there's, that, there's this great story from a play scholar who talks about uh, a polar bear was starving. And this expedition comes upon it. The polar bear couldn't get back to its feeding grounds. And they had a dog. And the dog hunches, you know, like the indication of play. And the polar bear and the dog would play together. And they did this for a couple of days, despite the fact that this animal was starving and probably should have eaten the dog, as, as you know, that's the logical dictate. But play was an important part of its kind of psychological well-being. So there's all those aspects that we could look into and, and, and think about when we discuss play. For us, we have, um, we use um, from a textbook, Salen and Zimmerman, the definition of play is free movement within a rigid structure. And, you know, that encompasses so much because if we think about a scientific experiment, there's the rigid structure, which says, this is the law. Uh, this is the law of physics. This is the law of that. And you're testing that. You're, you're having free movement. You're testing those boundaries. You're kind of shifting beyond that. So, for us, play is a form of experimentation. And, you, you know, you don't just play around. You don't just kid around. You don't just play games. You, you play with ideas. You play with design. You play with concept. It's, it's, this, it's actually much broader and more encompassing than, than just fun. Um, and, and the association with fun is sometimes quite detrimental because, you know, play can be quite serious. Uh, they have board games that I've played where people throw the stuff on the floor, um, <laughs> where they're, they're really invested. They're, it becomes something that is meaningful in, in many different ways, forming social relationships, um, understanding yourself better, understanding ideas better. It, it's kind of the fundamental... Uh, that's not to say it isn't fun because it also is just fun. Uh, life is better when you put, when you're a little bit playful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wonderful uh, defense of um, um, Marie. Do you have you found the um, I mean the, the sort of counter position to the to what Kieran was saying that sometimes uh, play can be treated as a secondary thing or as a trivial thing or not important. Have you found in resistance within the sort of establishments that you've worked in to treating gaming? with the seriousness that other, I mean, I know there's this issue about, is it art or not? I yeah. suppose that's a yeah. kind of cover for this. I mean, is there still resistance to thinking of these things are valid? In those yeah. Ways? Well, it's also also just knowing like all this conversation about dogs that I've got a young puppy um, and it's my first puppy. And so at the moment I was taking her out today and I've been trying to like reading about play bows and like trying to watch and observe her play and just be like, is this good puppy play? Is this bad puppy play? What's going on here? So I'm just like, oh, got all this talk about dogs and dog play. That's like 90% of my brain at the moment. But, um, but yeah, in terms of institutions, like to be honest, there's not been so much a hesitation to engage with the subject or, and there's been a lot of people, and especially at the VNA, I have to say, there was a huge amount of support um, and willingness to engage with this subject matter and, um, but I think the things that we struggle, that I struggle, well, I've struggled with in institutions is, is how hard it is to get people away, either because of their own biases or because they're kind of their expectations of audiences, get away from their expectations and some of the stereotypes that surround games. And so whenever I'm talking about the medium, like there's automatically this assumption that we're talking about it for kids. We're talking about it as fun. And we're talking about it through um, these things. It's like, Yes, games, games is there, but um, so the exhibition at the V&A was one which is, was it really looking at contemporary video games? And we did cover a lot of big sort of mainstream and AAA um, sort of titles within that space. Um, but for us to do an exhibition that was looking at video games through a contemporary lens, um, and then there's still kind of that expectation from say like, oh, but is this going to, when we're marketing this, is this going to be something that people are going to be able to bring their kids to? And it's like, well, if we really want to take video games seriously, 
how can we not acknowledge the fact that there is subject matter here that is hugely popular and hugely fascinating and controversial um, and amazing work that happens in a space that is games that are rated sort of 18 upwards, which is adult sort of entertainment. And so it's not necessarily that there is always sort of um, a wall against a willingness to engage with the subject, but I think it's just how do you get people past some of their stereotypes or some of the assumptions they have about the medium and, and allow us to have the same freedom and flexibility to explore the subject in a way that perhaps mediums that are more sort of embedded in those institutions have because we've gone through that learning curve. And so it's hard with a lot of institutions where they're kind of at the beginning of that learning and they're willing to learn, but um, but they still bring them necessarily, like and not necessarily even on a personal level, but in a systemic level that there's still that sort of those biases um, embedded within there. Thank you for that. That um, That's so interesting. Um, I want to ask you, um, Tim, on a, on a slightly different subject, but th this is about the kind of social justice gaming, let's call it, or, or kind of decolonial gaming that, we, that you've kind of talked to. Can you, I'm so fascinated by that. I just want to know if there, are there actual examples? I mean, you, you, you told us the example of a part of building an apartheid city and you showed us your own, your own game. Are there other examples out there in the world of games which are addressed at solving, fixing problems of, I don't know, water distribution or urban planning or, or if there aren't, what do you do you think there could be, and what kind of issues could could, could would gaming be really good at addressing? Uh, yeah, this is an interesting question. So from from my general experience, um, and it's possible that my knowledge is limited, um, the usual uh, approach most um, independent makers are doing when it comes to discussing such matters is to um, one of two things, which is primarily to um, represent their individual experiences. Um, so it's about their um, particular existence of like wanting to write about queer existences or black existences or any amongst of those existences at all. Um, or there are some uh, more closer to something of a, uh, interactive documentary pieces where people are looking towards demonstrating um, sensations of war um, or sensations of this, that, or the other. Um, I think um, more closer to like, the latter part of your question um, is uh, fundamentally yes. I think there's, there's something particularly interesting about, um, yeah, for me, the, basically the question is like, was has always been what it is about games that make them compelling or make them worthwhile when it comes to demonstrating and transferring a message. And um, my current um, uh, answer to that is that they are they um, effective at discussing and demonstrating and interrogating action and systems. Um, so, like the, the the examples that you presented, sort of. Uh, water distribution, for example, like that is certainly something that um, feels like it makes mo the most sense to, de to question that within uh, a game design space, um, as opposed to telling people through, through novels or through uh, um, filmic formats, uh, where through the, the consequences of infrastructure and uh, environmental constraints and social constraints, you use those aspects to um, actually build systems. And well, fundamentally that is what the games are. Um, and so those, those the, either, either the, the ways to do those things better or revealing um, how um, some municipality or whatever um, has done it badly um, is probably more effective at explaining that through the demonstration of a system that can be interacted with where you can see the consequences of your actions. And so it reveals the consequences. Because you're of taken actions. through a series of decisions that you have to make, and then you can understand how the decisions yeah. themselves yes. add up. Sorry, Kieran, please. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, uh, just adding on to Tim, there's, there's sort of two, two directions that I see within this scope. The one is what's called serious games, which are often trying to solve problems. And one of the, the difficulties I see with that is that it's, a self-selecting audience. Um, the people who are engaging with that kind of material already have that kind of mindset. Um, so if it's as opposed to something that can solve a problem, you know, someone makes a game, it's about how do you solve rubbish? How do you solve pollution? All of those kinds of things. The people who play that are generally 
people who are already interested in that topic. And, and that's why I like Tim's idea of sharing a personal perspective. And I think that that's where video games can become so powerful, not as, as, as problem solvers, but rather just awareness, different kinds of thoughts, different kinds of understanding of, of the world we live in. The put, sort of putting yourself in that position. So there's something yeah. about the placing you within that. Marie? Yeah. I like, I, I know for me, sort of, this is a space that I really so, do sort of agree with and, and, and enjoy sort of in this sort of, that, that we don't often sort of push music to define or say like, well, what is, what is music? And it's like, well, if you actually really push me to explain what that is, I don't really know what's happening there. Um, and the same with games, but, but that's sort of um, like, and this is something that's sort of obviously quite a sort of common and talked about subject, but I really like and appreciate the sort of, um, discussions that are had by, I would say, people such as Frank Lance um, from MYU Game Center or equally Nomi Clark from MYU Game Center. And I feel like they kind of stand it almost sort of in my head at two opposite ends of this idea of games as being the aesthetic form of systems. And I'm like, yes, here's a really uh-huh. interesting space that we can think about how we can understand what games are. Um, and sort of Frank sort of is existing perhaps at this side of my head as being sort of this really refined mechanics and sort of these peaks of like game design experience for us. Naomi Clark has given some really amazing, for me, so personally, really inspiring talks about um, games that almost have broken systems, games that are messy, games that are allowed to be interpreted because when a game is broken, when a game doesn't necessarily, and, and I mean broken in a sense of like, wait, these rules don't quite sort of add up or a good example is like, okay, you've got a box, uh, you've got your Monopoly game at home, but you're missing some of the playable pieces. What do you do? You might root around in your kitchen drawer and bring something to that game. And that means that you're kind of, changing it you're modding it you're, you're you're manipulating that game in a way that means that you're bringing part of yourself to it and i think these two extremes are so well not necessarily two extremes but i think they're really interesting ends of a spectrum and i think another games designer that i'd mentioned as well in that conversation is paola Pettuccini, who um is someone as well who does a lot of work with specifically looking at city building games like sim games and understanding how you can sort of um how we should really uh, understand and sort of really critically investigate the way that this, the way that the um, sort of rules of those games work, like what are they actually teaching us about cities? Are they actually how cities work? We've got an area of high crime. Does putting in a hundred police stations actually lower the crime in an area? Whereas if 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 in, we're playing that game and that didn't have, and we did that and it didn't have that response, we might think the game is broken. And so he does this really interesting sort of, um, it's done this really interesting sort of exploration into sort of re sort of purposing sims, and it almost feels like a commentary um, of what Kieran's talking about with um, serious games, like sort of critiquing that subject equally, but but understanding ultimately that um, games are the aesthetic form of systems, that no system in the world is actually, is, is not messy, is, is sort of everything is so complex. And games, we try and break them down into these smaller elements of like the, of, of sort of game design or the game mechanics. But actually, we even if we're trying to refine them, we actually, we can never really sort of properly reflect necessarily sort of the sheer complexity and messiness of um, the world, but actually maybe that's something to embrace with when we think about how games can be utilized aesthetically as a way to explore um, systems of the world and, and, and those systems also being sort of um, like our relationships to each other and our relationships to the world and the way that we organize um, sort of the way that we um, we sort of live essentially. That's a really wonderful kind of cut out, cut out and keep definition there. Um, the aesthetic form of systems. I think I it's a really good answer. When you I get asked that question, that it's like, bang, here it is. <laughs> you can have that one, Kieran, for your course. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of influence of games on culture and other things. I mean, it, you know, um, it strikes me that, I mean, you mentioned uh, Marvel films, uh, Marie, and they seem to have been influenced by the environment of games. Um, famously, um, the film 1916 kind of was almost like a player, you know, perspective from games. And I've recently come across this thing called Love, Death and Robots on Netflix, mm. short, these short things. And I think they're made by game designers. Is that right, Kieran? I'm not sure if they are made by games. I, I, I can't comment on that, but there's certainly that aesthetic is, exists it's, in a lot of them. Absolutely. I mean, I think the model there, I'm not quite sure. There are two, two guys that write it and then they send out the scripts to different studios. They're, all, they, they're made by a wide variety of studios. I don't know if those studios are animation studios, primarily, you know, mm-hmm. filmmakers or games, but gaming feels, the aesthetic of gaming is so pow- potent within these short um, films um, that it, it almost felt like it had pushed visual culture on, you know. The, the... Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I mean, the big example that we've seen of late is, is in particular, and, and speaking of the Euro that you mentioned earlier, is when footballers score and they perform actions that come from Fortnite. They're actually performing the dances that come from the game, which, you know, the biggest game in the world, the biggest sport in the world are, are meeting each other on the pitch in that moment of interaction with the audience who all know what they're referring to. So it's this huge cultural enterprise that's happening there. That has completely passed me by, I must say. Um, Marie, how would yeah. you talk about that, that relationship between kind of, you know, the, the more legacy media and the way that games become so potent within that? Mm, yeah, I guess it's an area that I always feel a little bit uncertain about thinking about where games sort of influences other areas. And I have to say, like, my brain automatically has always gone to sort of the visual aspect or the sort of cultural narrative aspect. And I think it's really interesting sort of Kieran highlighting the way that that can happen sort of culturally in this sort of um, this sort of communication between games and, and, and other sort of um, other sort of mediums or parts of culture. But I mean, the areas that ultimately come to mind is just not necessarily about the aesthetics of games, but understanding that the aesthetics of games comes from um, in part, a huge part, sort of the tools that they're actually um, created through and the way that those tools are now being utilized in other um, professions and other disciplines, sort of um, like sort of the way that sort of, uh, say, Unreal Engine or game engines might be used sort of within architecture or in the design of spaces. And so I think there's, there's areas as well that it's not necessarily sort of like, oh, there's pixels and bleepy bloopy sounds and that makes it like a game. It's like, no, we're talking more about sort of, there's something more sort of happening at another, a deeper level about sort of the, the fundamental sort of um, makeup of games and sort of the, 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 the mechanics or the weight, not mechanics, the, the sort of like DNA that's inherent within um, the discipline is, is, is being sort of brought into other spaces because those tools and that design language is valuable elsewhere. And, and people, and I guess through that, people are beginning to see sort of the parallels and the connections between um, between video games and other mediums. And I think that's only going to happen more and more. And I think it's it's something, and this maybe is a bit of a tangent, but it's something that I think has definitely been accepted so much more over the past year. And I think people's hand has been for has been forced to sort of embrace sort of um, like the one thing that I think, and there's a sort of apologies is possibly a bit of a tangent from what you're asking, but. One of the things that I think we've all hugely struggled with over the past sort of year and a half is how do we connect socially um, and emotionally with people through digital tools or through digital mediums when we can't be physically present and understanding that Zoom and understanding these sort of flat sort of face-to-face -face meetings don't actually emulate like a lot of the ways that we like to um, communicate or the way that we actually like to spend time with each other. We don't always stare at each other's faces constantly talking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we like to sit and be quiet. Sometimes we're just doing an activity together and it's like, hey, do you know what? Games has had that sorted for years, or video games has. This is a medium that allows you to be together in different spaces and to mm. explore and to meet strangers, to have sort of these sort of um, different moments and almost ironically sort of sometimes be quiet together. And so I think that is an area as well, the way that um, sort of our telecommunication tools and the ways that we are going to work together or be together or socialize together in future, I think is going to be sort of much more hugely influenced by games because of people just understanding, oh, it's not that this is this this is not just a medium about sort of kids and guns and and so on. Like actually, there's something so much more complex socially that's been happening here for decades, and we've, we're beginning to understand and embrace that rather than sort of necessarily casting it away with sort of oh, it's frivolous entertainment. It's like no, there's something really interesting here about embodiment and connection in digital spaces and the way and and doing tasks together. The way you put it, I think you, yeah, yeah. very interesting. Um, let, let, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, to you both actually who are teaching at, at VIT, about, you know, uh, gaming as a creative in economy in the sense that, I mean, those of us who were, are teaching in the kind of creative economy, arts and humanities are slightly aware that we may, we are teaching people who very much want to work in the creative industries, but is there the jobs out there for them? So what's the situation? I mean, how do you, you know, is it, is this the new frontier? Are there are, are your students? I know many of your students have gone on to find work in 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 gaming. Is it uh, is is the, is it a new place where people can find work? Is it is it growing? Is it shrinking? What's the kind? How does it feel to you at the moment? I mean, I, I think Tim's industry experience will equip him better there. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, you're saying we've gone to the university, Kieran. So yeah, but right. we we do we do pride ourselves in that our students have technical skills to get jobs in other digital spaces, even if it isn't games. But but I'll let Tim talk about the game economy in in particular. Yeah, what's your sense there, Tim? 
Yeah, so it's it is incredibly small. I think um, one of the one of the um, sort of qualitative stats uh, that I got given from one of the main people who does sort of general industry research um, is that there are four, maybe five, um, uh, reliably solid companies in the country that can actually take uh, that actually make games at all, whether it be through service or through um, original production. Um, that said, though, um, because of all the things mentioned and also just, um, I guess we are pumping out enough people qualified to perform the task. Um, there is quite a, a very uh, accelerated growth with regards to that. I think um, when I started in 2012, um, that number was significantly lower. Uh, I think there was one company and then maybe a couple of gambling companies, which we generally don't <laughs> factor into the equation as much. They kind of function as their own thing. They Statistically, they are functionally a different beast. Um, they, they are an established industry. They may produce lots of uh, revenue. Um, um, I do think, though, that there is something fascinating about um, um, particularly the way we do it, um, not, uh, but I do think it speaks to the, the, the consequence of being able to create games as a skill set uh, where, um, although fundamentally we are focused on producing game developers, that skill set does speak very strongly to a lot of different industries. And it's not just quite as much as straightforward as, oh, they program so they can go anywhere that program as a sort. Um, there is the, um, the more extended fact around, well, they, they're designers. Um, and so there's, there's certain kinds of insight that come from that and skill sets that come from that where there's a, um, they, have, they can be placed in quite a few places. Um, with specifically, as you mentioned, within the creative economy, I personally would love to see a point in time when one of my students is actually a policymaker within the government, but that's oh. that's a while away. <laughs> um, that would be a, that would be amazing to have a gamer in that position. Um, I have to. There's a kind of requirement in discussions like this that we have to, at some stage, get onto uh, the dreaded NFTs. So um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about this. But it kind of it's a theme which has bubbled up in this in this series of, of events, you know, a lot. Um, and most people have have prefaced what they've had to say by saying things like, "Well, I'm no expert, um, and I'm not quite sure about this area." And so I'm going to preface my remarks by saying, "I'm no expert, and I'm not quite sure." But Kieran, has it come up in? Has it? I mean, what I found is my students want to talk about it, and they're fascinated by NFT. These are non-fungible tokens. I think most people will be aware of this. this is a new yeah. way of turning digital things into valuable art assets and buying and selling them. How have you addressed that that question? And does it relate to gaming in any way? I mean, it, it's going to relate to gaming, and and there are going to be links, and it's going to be a big thing, and it's going to be a frustrating thing because it's going to feel like a kind of capitalist endeavor. But it certainly has come up in our classes. Um, I teach a course that deals with, you know, it's looking at interactive art as a <clears throat> broad concept, not just games, and and we look at. Walter Benjamin, we look at aura, we look at the kind of uniqueness of an experience. And one of the things that I try to say is, well, why games and interactive art is so interesting is because you create your own unique experience that only you can own. You, uh, you own that interaction, you own those moments of things. And now NFTs has changed that in terms of a digital landscape because you can actually own something that's digital. Um, and I had the exact same experience as you uh, at the beginning of this year. I was teaching my course. My curriculum was planned out. And then the students were like, oh, this is like NFTs. Oh, this is like NFTs. And I was like, well, I, I planned this curriculum. You're destroying it right now. But I, 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 I made the students write on it. Yeah. yeah. And and. And it's come up, so so it's going to be something, and that's going to change our curriculums. It's going to change our way of viewing the kind of business and monetary sense of what we do, which isn't a huge component though, because because we are an art school, and and because our, our core focus is still the criticality, still the 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 artistry of games. Uh, Marie, does this come up in in your world? I mean, I know that you're on the you're in the indie sector, let's say, but you, you know, there is a world out there of the, I mean, I, we certainly know that the, the big auction houses have started moving, you know, are happy to think about digital art as a, as, and, and NFTs and how, mm -hmm. how does it, how does it, how does it popped up on your horizon? 
it's 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 popped up in my horizon mostly from my Twitter thread. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm kind of curious, I mean, to be honest, I'm a bit exasperated from the fact that I was really sort of quite happy that I thought I could get through my life without understanding cryptocurrency and that side of things. And then the past year, the internet just decided, no, you need to understand what's going on over here. Um, and I think it's mostly through sort of a lot of the um, very sort of heated um, and, and controversial sort of discussions that exist around it. So I think so much of that is tied to um, such an emotional um, and understandable frustration from so many sort of creatives working within sort of the digital space and predominantly, yeah, people who have worked sort of um, across sort of the, the, the more sort of art or alternative side of games where it's like, there is not sort of um, bountiful resources here. And so there's a lot of people who are finally sort of beginning to feel like, oh, hang on a minute, there might be some sort of magical solution that actually sort of provides sort of funding opportunities. But obviously all of that is sort of countered with sort of the questionable sort of ethics around um, NFTs, which is mostly what the conversation is sort of for myself. It has been around sort of people um, being rightfully sort of very concerned about the environmental impacts of um, of NFTs and, and sort of Ethereum and so on, but, but also questioning sort of actually is that money actually going, is, is, is this actually sort of money that is actually going to sort of artists and creatives or are we hearing sort of headline stories from places? So for me at the moment, my thoughts around it are sort of still forming. I know that it's an area that I feel like I have like stomachache thinking about because <laughs> it's complicated and ethically I'm just sort of not, not sort of, it's not something I'm sort of particularly comfortable with. But I think the majority of people at the moment, I think, really enjoy the thought experiment of NFTs and thinking about them from a from a sort of um, all of the sort of complexities and legal complexities around what is them. It? And I'm a little bit like, is that is that going to hold up? Is that going to hold water in the long term? Yeah. But I mean, I must um, say, yeah, as someone like like Kieran, who teaches Walter Benjamin's great essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, it's great to have a very contemporary example of exactly that thing that he was talking yeah, about yeah and, the, and there's also and this area that i know nothing about is that the, the games that are already built on sort of um on sort of cryptocurrencies or sort of the block or the blockchain, blockchain that i'm just yeah. it's an area i'm just not familiar yeah, with me neither me neither um I, I found this so interesting i must say i mean i you know trying to think about the relationship of games to other parts of culture and other kinds of art but this this question of kind of systems of um a process and of decision making, which don't seem to be there in so many other kinds of art, which is so essential to your practice. It's really helped me to understand that and, and, and think about that deeply. So I really want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for joining us in this, uh, Kieran and Tim and Marie. And thank you very much to the audience as well. And anyone who's catching up with this on our YouTube page. Um, this is uh, the fifth in the series of five. So somewhere up above or below me, you can find the other videos. So. Uh, this would be the moment I would normally ask for applause and whatnot, but, you know, we're not in that situation. So let's do that and we'll go like that. Yeah, the, the jazz hands. Thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. And um, I can't wait to, uh, you know, to sort of look at some of those games that you've, you've turned me on to. I've made a list of all the things I need to be looking at. So thanks very much and good night. Thank you very Thank much, you. Good night. Cheers, Tim. Bye, Marie.